want to be funny. And now live from the Edinburgh Festival, it's Up Your Festival. <laughs> a couple of weeks and I uh, feel compelled to apologize. I am from the South in the United States. I was born in Alabama and raised in Georgia. I'm so Southern I'm related to myself. <laughs> we were raised in the Southern Baptist tradition, which meant that we had a large black velvet picture of Elvis's Last Supper in our living room. <laughs> As you know, it was a large pile of barbiturates under Mount Ararat. <laughs> Six years ago, I moved to New York City. Uh, for the culture, for the intellect, for the excitement, and I am greeted almost on a daily basis with things like, you're from where? I will never go down south. People sound so stupid when they talk. <laughs> Which is nice, because at least up there you don't see guys who wear fishing hats that say, shoot, Bubba, let's go kill something. <laughs> well, you see them, but they're cops. <laughs> The difference between Southern men and Northern men is actually vast because, well, in the South it's great. Men take what women think is our worst physical characteristic and then give you a compliment on it. Every time I go home I hear things like, well, I like big healthy women with sturdy feet. <laughs> or, uh, my mama says girls that sweat a lot are honest. <laughs> and in New York, men would never stoop to such base critiques. In New York, if a man likes you, you hear, Yo, you got a fat ass and a mustache. You want to dance with me or what? <laughs> That's why I married a southern man. I used to be married to a redneck from Macon, Georgia, because comedy has to start somewhere. And, oh, I knew it wouldn't work. I used to introduce him as my first husband while we were still together. <laughs> Just to watch that dim, confused look appear in his eyes. Wait a minute, if... <laughs> Never mind. He used to watch fishing shows and pay attention, and I don't mean President Bush's press conferences. He would, he would just watch and be like, I wonder what they gonna do next. Um, well, honey, they're probably gonna catch a big fish and let it go. Have you seen it before? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right now, for your musical enjoyment, they've been back here waiting. Please welcome Craig McMurdo in that swing thing with Ain't Got No Money. Thank you. 
self-esteem why am I in Edinburgh for a month um, oh don't take it so seriously now we go over to Malcolm Hardy to see who's been nominated for this year's much coveted snake bite award uh, there we are we've been up in Edinburgh a week now on the snake bite panel of Eton in this uh, salubrious club um, known as the Salamander Club in the um, Edinburgh only 50 yards from the Gilded Bloom this one's much more lively we were going to go to the assembly room we thought no and uh, most of the panel are, are still alive and we're coming to the point where we make the nominations for the worst act on the fringe. Um, I'll put my panels within first. Um, the one that I saw actually performed this club most nights and, um, and they're a double act and they're called Arnold and Colin. Um, Arnold does stand up of a sort and Colin plays a saxophone at the same time sometimes and sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> so I'm going to nominate Arnold and Colin for the, this year's State Light Award. <laughs> And Sarah, this is Sarah here. Um, have you seen anything particularly dreadful? Well, I did still, I still go with the first thing that I saw that I thought was particularly dreadful, which was The Cunning Linguist. Play on words. Uh, say that again. It's a play on words um, in the title. I doubt it. And uh, Mr. Luby, Chris Luby, how uh, played well, I've, I've seen uh, Ennio Marchetto, the, uh, the cunning origami artist <laughs> who changes clothes with bits of paper. On the side of the table, Wizzo. Uh, well, actually, I've just come to read the meter, so I'm just going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, uh, it's got to be a Cambridge foot right, I think, the most ridiculously stupid people jumping up and down in dustbins, shouting out condoms. And Chris? Uh, David Shield. It's just truly appalling. What, what does he do? Uh, sits at a piano, tells jokes, stories. Not wears, funny. A, wears a tank top. I found one at the Hill Street venue. It's called Asleep for Ten Years and it's by Gary Rowan Co. And it says device through improvisation using text and movement. And I think it's sufficient to say that <laughs> 45 minutes later he falls asleep on the chair, but the audience beat him by about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite good. That's good. I was going to give a special mention this year for Simon Fanshaw, but he's in enough trouble already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anyone that can get a review that says it's it's an act like the, the flea biting the rabid dog has got to have a mention. So there we are, and here are the uh, the lists, beautifully typed. <laughs> Arnold and Cullen, <laughs> Cullen Linguist, Ennio Machetto, Cambridge Footlights, David Schill, The Sleep of Ten Years, or is it for The Sleep of Ten Years, and a special commendation for Simon Fanshaw. <laughs> <laughs> I guess everybody wants to be a critic. I'd like to introduce two professional people right now, two very real doctors, Dr. Tony Gardner and Dr. Phil Hammond. Hi there, folks. We'd like to welcome you here to the studio, and of course, a especially warm welcome to Kenneth Clark. <laughs> Houseman? Yes, sir. Let's have a ward round, shall we? Yes, I think we might. Um, who shall our first patient be? Hmm. Do you mind holding this? 
As you can see, sir, this yeah. is a massively obese 55-year-old yes, lady yes, 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 who's yes. come to us having noticed blood on the paper on two separate occasions mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. She's fairly sure it was coming from the tail end, and indeed her period stopped when she was only seven. Really? Yes, yeah, some form yeah. of ovarian mm -hmm. failure yeah, was noted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, on examination, she does have quite juicy hemorrhoids at mm. 4, 7 and 11 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. The ones at 4 and 7 are second degree. The one at 11 o'clock is prolapsed. Really? She's been trying to pop it back in with the end of her toothbrush, and I fear this may have exacerbated <laughs> some of the bleeding. Yes. Tell me, Mrs. Um, Mrs. What's her name? Hemorrhoid. Mrs. Hemorrhoids. <laughs> is it a long history of short bits of blood or a short history of long bits of blood? And does the blood come rushing out before the stool? Is it a mixy mashy mish in between? Does it come shooting out afterwards? Is it easy to flush away? Do you wipe it? What's the matter with the woman? I think her problem is that she's NHS, sir. Oh. Poor old you. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, sir. <laughs> This chap, as you can see, has a long history of inadequate personality. Yes, yes. yes. He's been under the psychiatrist seven times, mm. been sectioned four times, and three public toilet offences. Mm. He first came to us having lost four stone in weight. Mm. We did a scan, and in fact, it showed a mass at the head of the pancreas. Yeah, yeah. You opened him up last night did I? and closed <laughs> him up fairly quickly. We right. do have the histology back, sir, <coughs> and it does indeed confirm he has cancer. He's got what? Cancer. What? Cancer. Oh, cancer! <laughs> cancer! Cancer of the head of the pancreas. Mm. Well, um. You're batting on a bit of a sticky wicket, aren't you? Yes. Next. Oh, dear. This, uh, this little floozy is with us again. Uh, <laughs> she's uh, seen her before. She's seen her pregnant before. again. Oh, again, again, yeah. Multiple partners, mm. not really sure who the father is. Oh, really? She, she claims it was an accident. Stop! <laughs> it was an accident, was it? Now, don't tell me. You were walking down the street, and you tripped over a loose paving slab and fell onto an erect penis. <laughs> Very good, sir. Very fresh, very yeah, alive. I like that one. That's good. I don't know why your partner's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> this chap is a bit of a puzzle to us. Mm. He's a 70-year-old retired pet shop owner with yeah. a long history of fish fancier's finger. Mm. <laughs> anyway, he came to us with a gross amount of inguinal lymphadenopathy. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a dorsal angulation of the tantra. Of the what? Penis. The penis. And weight has literally been dripping off, and we mm. don't know what's wrong with him. And frankly, sir, I'm surprised he's still with us. Really? Mm. Sir, from, uh, from what Dr. Hammond's telling me, we're not entirely sure what the diagnosis is at the moment, but um, I'm sure we'll find out at the post-mortem. <laughs> <laughs> well done, you. Wasn't that colorful and informative? <laughs> I have my own medical theory. I think men should menstruate. Not only is their name in the word, but if you just think, <laughs> really think now about the situation that the world is in, I mean, maybe that's why men declare war, because they have a need to bleed on a regular basis. <laughs> but I'm not a doctor. Okay, we have more show. Earlier today, our reporter, David Cliché, was out and about following the progress of the Bournemouth University media students. This is David Cliché reporting from the mound, where a person need only be wearing a Macintosh and holding a microphone to attract, literally, this many people. Today, the Bournemouth University Media Society are here in a desperate effort to drum up publicity and get an audience for their two shows, Gur Thatcher and A Couple of Bums, their comedy about homelessness. With some drastic rewriting to make the show topical and up-to-date, they will be performing somewhere around here an extract from A Couple of Bums. Uh, Thatcher! People have to complain about things. Midday, if ever I was homeless, I just moved my other castle. You mean like Arthur Scargill? <laughs> and another thing, it's better to be homeless in Britain than living in a palace in Kuwait. Yes, and another thing, I've just heard that Northamptonshire have got through to the final of the Nat West Trophy. And another thing, um, unemployment is at its highest level for six years. And so I don't see why homelessness is such a problem. I mean, they never mention it on neighbours. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, did you just enjoy that extract? Uh, excuse me, did you just see a show that was on there about oh, ten oh, seconds sorry, ago? No, I didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, excuse me, um, there was a little show going on here about two minutes ago. Did you see any of it? Yes, I did. Well, um, did you enjoy it? Yes, it was quite good. Do you think you'll come and see the show? Well, I find out where the venue is. Okay, then it's venue 99. Thank you. Thank you.
rousing rendition of Amazing Grace. And now I've heard that we can, we can go over live for exclusive coverage of the virgin performance of the Bournemouth University Meter, Media Students Act. That's good. Just remember, Thatcher, you used to be the milk snatcher. But the kids won't stand for it. Because we won't let them. Good Thatcher! David Cliché, up your festival, alone. Well, I guess it's all right to make fun of our own leaders. I mean, I'm from a country where it's supposed to be possible for any little boy to grow up and be president. And as living proof, a little boy is now vice president. So, they hate it over there. If I do any jokes about Vice President Quayle or President Bush, especially the men, they get very upset. Like, young lady, that's our commander-in-chief. You show some respect. I know why men like Bush and Quayle. Because they figure if they can get that far, there's no end to what they can accomplish. <laughs> okay, now I know you're all supposed to pay the poll tax at the moment, but what you may not know is that there's been a development today here in this city. For a report, here's Sophie Trout. It's just been announced that fringe performers who stay the full three weeks in Edinburgh are eligible for the poll tax. So, how has this ruling affected this year's festival? Let's take a look. Hi-ho, hi-ho, I have to work on my own. This is the new children's play, Snow White and the One Dwarf, under 18 years of age. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's terrible this year. Everyone's trying to avoid paying the poll tax. So there's uh, one bride for one brother, no gentleman of Verona, and, of course, Chekhov's three sisters, although one of them's not actually a resident here, and the other two are being mayors at their old address. And some productions have even been evicted from their venues and found themselves homeless, like the Bolshoi Opera Company. It's very interesting, isn't it? Hey, do you mind taking your hat off? Meanwhile, a test case has been brought before the courts. You have been found guilty of the most heinous pub bombings, and I therefore sentence you to have your testicles tied to a train. Oh, oh uh, sorry. Uh, call Marcel Maimo. Mr. Maimo, could you explain to the court why you haven't paid your poll tax? You were trapped in a glass box. And there was a, a very strong wind. Guilty. I condemn you to two weeks watching the Cambridge Footlights. What justification can there be for this terrible tax? We asked the Association of Scottish Conservative MPs. Yes, they're the only group of people who won't have to worry about paying the poll tax in Scotland. was something forced upon an immigrant from Warsaw, but what do you expect an American to know? So when you came in here tonight, did you see they were collecting money outside, the animal activists, and me wearing this? I felt kind of guilty, but is it just me in a world with homelessness, hunger, AIDS, nuclear proliferation? The last thing I'm really thinking about is how a chinchilla feels when you step on its little head to keep warm. <laughs> well, maybe I I'm defensive because I have a fur coat. It's, it's not a great fur coat, it's, it's a Labrador Retriever. But, well, it's warm, but you just can't wear it near the water, that's all. <laughs> Afraid of becoming one of those hideously vain American women, I guess they're all over the world, the ones who have so much cosmetic surgery, they start to look like lizards. <laughs> their necks begin to grasp out at the jugular veins, they carry tips in their neck like this. I'd love to laugh out loud, but my stitches would fly everywhere. <laughs> America's own queen mother has, is like that. Well, she's not really a queen. Well, it's Nancy Reagan. I mean, she thinks she's a queen, and we know she's a mother. Um, <laughs> even young women act... What, are you friends with her here? Is that it? Um, <laughs> come on, she's even out of office now. Lighten up. Um, I did. I went into the uh, John Lewis here the other day. Okay, I'm 32 years old. I really am not in need of this particular phenomenon in society. A horde of young, prepubescent women come up and spray you with cologne against your will. I don't need this. I really don't. It's like a 19-year-old girl standing there going, obsession. 
Shut up. You're too young to know what it means. Obsession is a fragrance by Calvin Klein. No, it's not. Obsession is roaming around the bushes outside of a married man's house at midnight. <laughs> with a machete in one hand and a jar of mentholatum in the other. Now get out of my way before I debone you and make a hat band out of you. <laughs> we even have an import, I believe, from Australia. She advertises, at least in America, for L'Oreal. And the ad is uh, for, the caption for the ad is, Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. I've seen Kelly LeBrock. Being beautiful is probably all that keeps her breathing. Well, I'm not saying she's stupid, but when the wind blows really hard, her forehead buckles in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, a feature from the Australian superstar Bob Down for another interview from the Fringe Club. Cole Elliot. Cole, how are you doing? Have you played Mooloolan Ball lately? Uh, mate, actually, I'm not Cole. I'm his roadie, Chooka Dennis. Oh, Chooka, I know you well. I like that hair. You've been doing it. You just touched it up for the fringe. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, actually, uh, I had a really good flight in British Airways from Sydney. Uh, they said to me, where would you like to sit? You know, I sit on that black box. You always seem to find it, you know. Ooh, I flew uh, Garuda myself. Oh, mate. I, I nearly had one. Yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, no, actually, uh, what's happened to me is... Uh, we flew in, I'm going to be nervous, I was sitting on board with uh, 300 born-again Christians. Man, you've got no idea how bad it is knowing you're the only one on board who, who's actually worried if you're going to die or not, you know. They said, are you born again? I said, no, my mum got it right the first time. And, uh, Too I'm, here with, I'm here with Mr. Elliot, you know. Uh -huh. So we're doing his show, look at that one. Uh, Colin Elliot, it's a bloody great Australian comic. Green gold. Yeah, great bloke. He, he, looks, he looks familiar. Yeah, uh, he's my boss, you know. Uh, we come to... Hey, excuse me, Carl, I just had to challenge you on something I saw on the thing. Australia's most popular comedian. This is an interesting claim. Uh, it, yeah, well, we've got is to Is that say... referring by any chance to Carl? Uh, yeah, it is. We've got to say that because we know we're getting nobody on the show, you know That's what right. I'm saying? Absolutely. So we've got to say that. Okay, thing, Carl. Right? Thanks very much indeed, mate. Oh, yeah. Catch you down under. <laughs> See what I have to put up with. jokes were funny when I heard them in America, too. Um, please welcome once again Craig McMurdo Band with Big Fat Mamas are back in style. Listen, sister, you shouldn't wear that smile.